Ah, thank you, everybody. You always get a little bit nervous when you're the third talk on a, t on a subject in a row. You start worrying about which of your slides you have to throw out or modify or correct. Uh, but, and turn on the clicker. There we go. Hi, I'm Casey Schaffler. I've been doing kernel development uh, since 1978. So I've seen all kinds of interesting things going into, into the code base. <clears throat> um, why don't we think the kernel is hard? Uh, for anybody here a kernel developer who does not work in security? Let's see. Okay, good. Good. So this, this won't be completely wasted. Uh, <laughs> first thing, it's too easy to cause damage. We all know, we all know about buffer overflows, and stack leaks, and string functions. And it's just there are so many different ways that you can cause the kernel to do things that, that you don't want to do it, either for bugs or malicious. It's just, it, it's still too easy. Um, and at this point, we've got a bunch of people who want to do damage, who are really clever. Um, and not only are they clever, they're motivated. They're making money off of it. Uh, exploits, stealing credit cards, all kinds of good things. Um, even we, we have a, a title which has evolved over the past few years of security researcher. Uh, used to be called hackers. Now, now you've got to differentiate between the good guys and the bad, so now they're security researchers. Uh, if they've come out in the public and done something that they're getting paid for as part of their job, they get called a security researcher. Otherwise, they're, uh, they're a miscreant of some sort. Um, but that's not new, is it? It's like we've known about this for some time. So what's kind of the base of the problem? How old is this problem, really? And really, it's as old as the C compiler. Um, if you've ever, had, ever seen the original uh, K, uh, Kernahan Ritchie uh, C book, that's about yay big, and it's, it's, in, a small, it's in a small format. And uh, it's really easy to read. I, I learned it, I used it as part of my, my educational process in learning how to do programming, which explains a lot about my code if you've ever seen it. Uh, but the C language was written in a time where operating systems were written in assembler. In fact, text formatters were written in assembler. In fact, virtually everything was written in assembler. Uh, and for systems programming, C is a really, really, really good language because it allows you to do the things that you can do in assembler while actually giving you some rational structure to your program. So you can organize your memory with data structures and you can, your control flow, is, you can follow your control flow because of the way the, 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 the constructs in the language um, provide for. That's, but it's not strongly typed. Um, it's more a suggestion or a, a um, guideline than, than an actual uh, rule set. Uh, and this is efficient and convenient. It's like you can do a lot of really things, really interesting things efficiently. For example, yeah, my favorite one is the one where you have a, a, a data structure which defines a header and then it divide, def, defines a one, one element array. And you can use this, you can allocate memory for your, your data structure and say, hey, this thing's actually got 74 things in it. So you allocate, allocate enough memory for 70, 74 things plus the header and, and you're good. You don't have to worry about then. You can dereference it uh, appropriately. So you can understand what you're doing even though you haven't constrained yourself uh, by the data type, okay? You can be clever and you can be precise the way you have to do sometimes. For example, uh, if you have a, an internet protocol header, you don't know at the beginning whether it's an IPv6 and an, or an IPv4, and the structure is different depending on that. So you can actually go look in the, yeah, you can have a data structure that defines what this is, and if you say, oh, that's the wrong one, after you go look, you can go switch it. That's pretty convenient. You can't do that in a strongly typed language. And now, so with all that good stuff to say about it, why would I want to give it up? And the answer is you probably don't. We all know that strong typing is for weak minds. 
and, and strongly typed languages have their own issues. For example, if you have a piece of data which legitimately might be an IPv6 header or an IPv4 header, how do you declare that in a strongly typed language? The answer is you can't. Yeah, you need to have some way to circumvent the strong typing in order to deal with that kind of data. Um, now, you could talk about object-oriented programming. That's always, a, always one of my favorites. Let's, uh, let's do garbage collection during, in, during an interrupt handler. Yeah, <laughs> real-time impacts are, are awfully good on that. Uh, and the other thing is, every now and then I'll hear somebody say, hey, let's rewrite the kernel in Rust or the language du jour. Uh, and I say, great, how are you going to do that? Well, we'll automatically convert it. You know, we'll write some, some awk scripts. Or we don't use awk anymore, do we? We're past that. Right? No, Perl. No, wait a minute, we're past that. Too. Damn. Huh. Uh, we'll, we'll use, again, we'll use su some interesting language, and we're going to just you know, do an auto-convert, and that will work for about 90% of, of the system, at which point we hit the 90-90 rule, which is that 90% of the of the code can be converted in 90% of the time, and the last 10% will take the other 90% of the time. But there are things we can do. Um, we can use the typing that's available. That makes things a little bit easier. Now, we can fix what we know is dangerous. Um, Keys talked about a case, sorry, known him for years, and I still get that wrong. And only in public. Uh, okay, uh, we, fix, we can fix things that we know are dangerous. And you know, we can prepare for failure because we know it's going to happen anyway. So typing, how does that help? Let's see. Well, our good example here is, is as Case referenced, uh, taught, referenced earlier, uh, the ref count T. Now, a reference count is a very, very specific kind of behavior. It, it, it really is an integer, but you are using it in a very specific way. Uh, it's got a couple of properties that make it very interesting. Uh, one of which is that it should never be zero, uh, and that you should never assign to it. You should only ever increment it or decrement it, or look at it um, in the case of, of freeing it. So if we use a ref count T in a place where it's appropriate, we can control the behavior of that, and we can put checks into the, the handling of ref count T so that when we find a problem, we can assume that something bad is gone, bad has happened. Either it's been attacked or there's a bug. Um, at that point, we don't know and we don't really care. We just can just say, oh, bad thing happened in a ref count T. And it'll, that'll find a lot of bugs, prevent a lot of attacks. Good thing. So what do we know can be dangerous? Well, <laughs> string functions. Um, I would... Anybody notice what's wrong with the, uh, the stern copy uh, example here? Somebody must be able to figure that out. Actually, it shouldn't be a sterlin of anything. <laughs> yeah, if it were the sterlin of desk, that would be whatever's already there. Um, of, of the source means it's coming, you're saying, oh yeah, we'll just copy everything that's, and actually there are two bugs in the second one, because if it's actually the exact length of dest, you're going to lose the actually you're going to lose the uh, you're going to lose the terminating null. So, say there are two bugs in that. So, the thing with string functions is that if you use them correctly, it's okay. The problem is that we've got a lot of people who've never learned to use them right. Oh well, uh, maybe they shouldn't be programming in the kernel. We've got um, no JS these days. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, and then automatic arrays. Um, Case was talking about this earlier. Um, why is this a problem? Well, because you've got a function where you're, you're going to say, I want an array, you know, I need an array here and it needs to be big enough for whatever the, the caller is, is using, so he's gonna tell me how big it is. Well, we got two, two choices here if we wanna actually make things safe. Either we can check in, the, in my function here to make sure that that number's appropriate, or I can check all the places that call it 
and make sure that that number is appropriate. But both of those, those uh, approaches have, have their problems. When do you know what's appropriate? Uh, when we're doing casts, um, you can cast, you can say, I want to treat, you know, I want a pointer to this object over here, and I want to treat it like a cred structure. OK, but if i is an integer, um, I've got problems, because it's not, clearly not enough space for the credential. On the other hand, if it's something that's bigger than the credential, I may not be fixing, you know, setting all the information that I need because the cred is you know, only so big, and if I really am, have got a cred and then some stuff after it, I'm not setting that, I may have trouble there. So casts are kind of dangerous in, in this case. And uh, then my second example here, I'll leave it as an, an example to you to figure out what that is supposed to do. Um, but really, what should have happened here is uh, that temp should have been defined as an unsigned int, and then there wouldn't be any problems at all. Uh, by the way, 80% of casts, and I'm making this statistic up on the fly, 80% uh, of casts are incorrect or unnecessary. Now, it's not that these things can't be used safely. They can be. But checking that you, that, you know, doing checks on your parameters can be expensive. And sometimes you don't, you know, and if you, uh, if you make the check at the, at the end, uh, you may be making a whole lot of checks you don't need to. And if you make it fr from all the places that are calling it, well, what about out of three modules that you can't see? Are they doing it correctly? So we got, a, we got an issue here. It's like you got to figure out which is more important. You know, do you find all the places to call it? Are you doing check there? Are you going to put the check here? And everybody's going to go through it, even though all but one of your callers isn't, you know, isn't doing it incorrectly. It can be a balancing act. Stacks. Why can't we get rid of stacks? You know, there, there are machines that didn't used to have them. Uh, but anyway, here's a picture of the guy who invented them. You can blame him. Um, they're convenient. You push stuff on them. You pull. You pop stuff off of it. Uh, it can be hardware accelerated. They're really great, uh, but they're also convenient for mucking up. Why is that? Well, if you're in a function, you know that that the stuff, the parameters for the functions that are in the in the trace that got got you there, are on the stack. You could go look at them. No, no, no need to actually think about. You know, passing everything, you just go go look on stack, see what was there, um, and you know that anybody you called, the, you know, the last function you called is still on the stack below you, so you can just go look there, right? Uh, if you know you you make a call and then a while later, you, you know he had an intermediate result that I could use, so you go just just you know where it is on the stack, you've read, read the code, so you just go look for it. Um, or if heaven forbid you're an attacker you can use that same mindset to go find information you probably shouldn't have. Uh, there are some intermediate states from functions you're calling you probably shouldn't be seeing. Now, you can make it harder to, get to do that. Uh, you can put gaps between the stack, you know, between the stack uh, elements, that stack pages. That works. That, that's a big help. You can if you know what, what the gaps are, you can still work your way around that. Or if you're cleverer than I am, you can come up with other ways. Um, you can erase what, what's no longer needed. You know, Case was talking about this earlier. So you come out of a function, you erase the, you erase the stack. That solves that half of the problem right there. Um, now I just had a random thought. Ha, 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 ha. Um, let's randomize everything so that nobody knows where it is. That'll, that'll take those hackers and you know, just whack them up the head because they won't be able to find anything anymore. Um, well, attackers and developers hate randomization, and they both hate it for the same reason. And that is, it makes it really hard to find where things are when things, go, when things aren't working the way the code is supposed to. Uh, sometimes you really need the real address of something, or if you have the real address, it's much easier to exploit. If you're looking at logs trying to figure out where your bug is, or you're looking at a log to figure out uh, where, where data is that you want to get at, uh, and you don't have the address in the log, it's really tough to do that. You have to start working. And of course, anytime you've written a debugger, it's like you've written the debugger, it's out, released, yay, it's, I haven't supported it for two years, and all of a sudden, 
bam, we've got hashed addresses. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to rewrite my tool to deal with the fact that the address isn't really the address. It's an arbitrary representation of the address, which may or may not be accurate relative to the other addresses. Uh, things, yeah, my tools get buggered. Uh, we can randomize data structures. This is always fun. Someone has spent months getting this data structure in the right order so that on that ARM64 ARM box that they've got, it, the caches never miss, ever, ever. And so now you put a little thing in, into the compiler that says, oh, just whoop the things around into different orders. Now, not only are you missing your cache lines, but the structure actually got smaller because their ordering is, you know, the random order happens to be better from a, a size, size uh, viewpoint than your careful cache line thingy. Um, and so now your system actually runs, sl runs slower and uh, this is all bad. And it's in the networking, st networking stack and everybody knows that nothing is more critical than cache lines in the networking stack. Um, so there, there are, uh, we have this in now. You can say you want, you want to randomize your layout or not randomize your layout um, or let the system decide for you. It's okay. It's really the, one, of the, one of the big benefits of this makes it hard for somebody who's running a, a, a program to find a particular data structure in memory to do so because if they don't know where, what the order things are in, um, they can't fingerprint it. Okay, stack pages. Stack pages are just pages, right? There's no reason we can't just shuffle them around and put them wherever we want. Uh, no reason they have to be in any particular place. Uh, we'll leave this as an exercise to the reader. Um, functions. Yeah. There's no reason that functions in, a, in the kernel should be in any particular order. Um, there are optim optimizations that that are a little bit trickier if you're going to randomize the order of functions, but not that much, right? Um, and again, this makes it a lot harder for somebody who is looking at the system to find, thing, find where things are so that they can go and find um, how, how they're going about, it, go, how they're going to go about exploiting it. Thank you. Um, this is a lot harder if you want to do it on every boot than it is if you want to do it at build time. Um, but again, there are a lot of clever people out there who know compilers, which I fortunately don't. Um, now, do I have to worry about performance in all this when I'm doing my, you know, looking at making the kernel harder um, or just doing things in general? And it's like, does the sun set in the west? Um, yeah, actually it does. Why do I have to be uh, particularly concerned about performance? Well, true story. It's happened to me. All right. Hey, we want to put this security code into the networking stack. No. Well, why not? We can't measure any performance. Well, then your benchmarks aren't good enough. Oh, okay. Work, 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 work. Hey, we've got benchmarks now. Up, up, new, up. They still can't find, still can't find, and still can't find anything. Finally, got a new piece of, of networking hardware in that was 10 times the performance of anything we'd had previously. Yes. In this case, in this error case, under these circumstances, we have a 2% performance degradation. Okay, great, you can't check that in because it has a performance impact. Okay, well, fix, 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 get clever, get clever. Hey, look, uh, we fixed that performance impact, so it now has no performance impact. Uh, can we check it in? No, your benchmarks aren't good enough. Okay, so performance is always gonna be critical, um, and there's a reason for this. Oh, damn. I hate it when my slides show up before they're supposed to. Okay, performance trumps security more often than not. Uh, unless you're in an environment that has explicitly made the decision that they are going to take security over performance, performance will win in an argument. And the rash reason for this is really pretty simple. Uh, performance is objective and quantitative. You can come up with a performance number. You can say 2% degradation or 50% degradation, or I ran this benchmark and I got a 17 instead of a 32. You can come, they, you, if you're a performance guy, you can come in with a number. 
Numbers are really easy to use when you're making an argument. Uh, whereas security is, uh, is quantum. Okay. If you don't know of any problems, any security problems with some code, well, nobody cares about security in that code. If you've identified a possible vulnerability, well, there are a few people who are interested, but really, in general, uh, nobody cares. You're not going to win an argument with that. If you've demonstrated a vulnerability, people start to notice it. But until it's exploited and has a name, nobody gives a rat's um, anatomy. <laughs> uh, but again, once it's exploited, people can, until it's exploited, you can't go into an argument with a performance guy because a performance guy is going to come in with a number. So at the end, is it worth the bother? It's like um, some of the stuff that we're doing in kernel hardening is really kind of minutia or really looks like it. Um, we introduce code churn, uh, ref count T. 180 files with ref count T's in them. Uh, 500 instances of ref count T's in those files. And there's still more to do, OK? Um, the variable length arrays. Yeah, it's like we're turning a bunch of code here. We're turning code that hasn't been touched in years. In order to do this hypothetical security, possible maybe someday somebody's going to have a problem with that stuff. And we're introducing runtime overhead when we do it. Um, not always. I was like, some of the, the removals of the, the variable length arrays have actually sped things up. Uh, hardened user copy, on the other hand, has real performance impact. Uh, there are cases where people were copying, <laughs> copying information from inappropriate places in the user space and vice versa. Uh, you certainly don't want to co copy directly from user space into a DMA area, for example. Uh, that's usually a bad thing to do. Um, and we introduce, you introduce a lot of checks in places. Um, when audit went in, for example, uh, there was a lot of concern about how much impact it would have on every system call. Well, and that's com these are completely legitimate concerns. And the other thing you have to worry about is the developer experience. Uh, OK, now there's the user experience, there's the developer experience. Um, the Linux community has been very big on the developer experience. Linus Torvalds is very big on the developer experience, because if you don't have a good developer experience, you don't have developers. Uh, and developers are really pretty important, especially in, in a situation where not everybody who's working on, on the code is getting paid to do it. Um, now, some of the things that we, can, that we do are as are simple as check patch, all right? You put something in a check patch that says, hey, you know what? Uh, you're using this, this interface, but it's, that's deprecated. You shouldn't be using that. Or you're using this, this function in a way that's, that's really not appropriate. That, OK, well, I haven't checked the code in yet. Yeah, I can fix that before I do it. Uh, it can also, be, on the other hand, it can be pretty picky, like the, uh, the whole thing with percent %p, um, where percent %p has, that's how you're printing a pointer. Um, there was a lot of debate on that, about how that should be handled. Um, eventually, it ended up being the simplest way, but before that, there were a lot of proposals like, well, you only, you, you report percent P, you warn about percent P, and you only allow people to use it under these circumstances or with these modifiers. Uh, finally, just uh, dealing with it took care of it. But that was a choice, you know, that was a choice in the developer experience of, you know, Linus. And we see a lot of compiler warnings. How many, how many people remember Lint? Okay, for, for, for those of you who are under 35, uh, Lint was w, dash w uh, before there was a dash w, when the compiler just said, yeah, I can do that. Uh, the more compiler warnings we generate, um, the slower things can be. Uh, compiler warnings 
about casts and about data and about data structure usage really should be paid attention to. And that's, I think, and that's one of the, the big reasons why we have that policy in the Linux kernel that we don't introduce warnings and that we get rid of warnings because we put them there for a reason. Because the stuff that, that you're being warned about really can be dangerous. Uh, finally, you know, harder is subjective. You know, is, it, is the kernel actually harder when I make these changes? Does it really make it harder for people to develop the kernel if I make these changes? E, yes, sometimes, yes, it is. Yes, we're making it harder here, but are we making it more harder over here? Uh, so the answer to the original question, uh, yes, it is harder. Uh, we are making it harder to develop the kernel. Um, but the community is buying into it. I think before, uh, you know, you know, 10 years ago, they wouldn't have. Now, why is this? Well, part of it is that we're working in the open. Previous efforts that I won't mention by name um, that were done off on the side in their own patch stream um, for, for direct commercial um, exploitation weren't going in. And the, the reason for it, you know, pretty clear here is that that's not a community effort, okay? Community effort makes a huge difference, whether you're talking about performance, security, um, functionality, support for obscure and bizarre and unnatural hardware, it doesn't matter. The kernel, you know, being involved in the community, getting the feedback, giving feedback, um, working to, with everybody to make everything better um, gets you some slack. Uh, the amount of help we've been getting on this has been awesome. Um, every now and then you think, oh God, I'm working so hard on it. And then you look at the, at the, the people who have contributed to the work you're doing and you say, oh, I don't have no idea who this person is. You know, they popped out of the woodwork and, and made this little comment here. And all of a sudden my code runs in half the time. Thank you. Yeah, or I was going to do it this way. We looked at, at you know, looked at, at the, the 45 different interfaces that that involved and somebody said, dude, why don't you just do this? And you say, oh, <laughs> duh. Uh, or even better, it's like, oh yeah, somebody, somebody else had a patch for that, but then they got sick. Uh, maybe you should look at that. Cool, okay, so again, the amount of help we're getting, just in incredible. Uh, the community really is buying into this. But at the same time, we're still learning where the bounds are. Um, as Case was saying earlier, you know, when he, or has commented earlier, yeah, when you do your pull request, you, th you pull on your asbestos underwear um, and hold your breath until you get a response. Um, sometimes it goes, goes in when you don't expect it to. Sometimes you get um, <clears throat> feedback. <laughs> but on, on the whole, um, we're making, the current, making it a little bit harder for people to develop in general, and we're making it easier for people to maintain because with fewer bugs, fewer exploits, people can go work on new stuff instead. Thank you. So, questions? <laughs> questions? No, don't, no, not for the questions. Are there any questions? Just a small comment. I wouldn't completely discard Rust as a potential language to use in Linux. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reasons are that, that it's, it's probably works in an environment where, where you have both C code and, and Rust code. I mean, I mean, it's using the Firefox that way. So that, so that portions are, are written with, with Rust. Well, and, uh, I, and generally speaking, all, all, all the most of the kernel developers that, that I know love Rust, so, so it, it has much stronger okay. support in the community okay. than, than well, for, hang example, on, hang on. For, okay. for example, C++. Yarko. C++. Yarko. Yarko. Okay, quick poll. How many kernel developers here uh, know Rust? How many kernel developers do not know Rust? Uh, it looks like about three to one against. 
<laughs> Our questions? Next question. I'll, and I'll be nicer to you than I was to Yarko. That's all right. Um, Gurney Hunt, um, your, your comment about performance versus security is certainly true historically. But at least on the hardware side of the house, for which the kernel is the sibling of the hardware, that's shifting because um, people are beginning to realize they've got to think about the security implications of their microarchitectures or they get screwed in the long run through exploitation. Um, so so I, don't you think, no, don't you think no, we I, ought to rethink or we ought to figure out how to balance this thing between performance and security rather than say one always wins and the other one always loses? Uh, I'm trying to balance this off. Um, let, I think that I am safer career-wise not to say anything about hardware development processes. <laughs> I just... Uh, within the kernel, I think I I really think that we're still going to see until somebody makes a big stink about. Well, okay. First off, we're uh, as I've said, we're getting better about being able to do hardening stuff, proactive um, things, even if there there is some impact. But we still have to come in and say, here is the kind of exploit that we expect to have, a, have, a, have this as a problem, regardless of what the hardware does. Okay, and um, we are seeing a change in new hardware features for security that make more sense than what we've seen in the past. So in the past, we've seen, you know, WYSI hardware features intended to help security uh, get introduced and people look at them and say, gee, huh, how are we supposed to use that? And it's like, yeah, ring architectures are per a perfect example. Yeah, you have a, a machine with 17 rings for security architecture. And everybody looks at it and says, huh, cool, ring zero, ring, ring something else. Um, and the other, the other uh, example, I, uh, Tom Lyon had a paper on this in the 1970s. Uh, was about a chip that he got for his Unix machine. They were building a new ma Unix machine. And it was a time, a time chip. And it would give you daylight savings time, you know, time in three different time zones. It would give all kinds of wonderful things. And, and they said, well, great, but how do I make it give me seconds? You know, seconds since January 1st, 1970, because that's the only thing I care about. Um, so spiffy hardware, anything about hardware, I don't think we can count on that um, in the performance yeah, security argument. Um, I think in speaking to the balance between performance and security, um, where there is a trade-off on that, because there isn't always, you can get security features in where there's no problem, and everyone says, that sounds great, let's do it. Um, those are the easy wins, but uh, for the ones that are harder, I've seen uh, a shift in the culture in the kernel. Um, it used to be that nothing would win against performance. Um, and as you start demonstrating this long history of attacks against the kernel, um, that has begun to move. And I would say that there is a bigger shift in uh, getting rid of bug classes, like accepting a performance hit for killing a bug class is easier for maintainers to accept uh, than killing um, exploitation classes uh, because that's too far away from what people are sort of thinking about. The old style was, well, why do we need to kill the bug class? Let's just fix the bugs. I was like, but that's not the right approach. Um, and I think the 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 needle has moved enough that we say, okay, I guess we can get rid of bug classes, but why kill exploitation methods? They need a whole series of bugs to make that work. Um, so I'm hoping there will be some balance point that we reach, but I'm, I'm still pushing to get as far towards killing everything as we can. Um, just my thought on the balance and how we'll reach it. 
So I propose we do continue discussion. I'm sorry, continue discussion over the break, which is now. So let's break for a break. And just to note, so there is now a board here for the first February session proposal. So I know that there is already one plant on TPM and with TPM Genie in the afternoon. So please, if you have more, put it just on the board. There is the uh, writing device there. So and let's get back at um, 20 past.